Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Mary Howard. Mary is the Community Cat Coordinator at McKamey Animal Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Their Community Cat Program started in October of 2018 when they received a grant from Best Friends Animal Society. Thanks to this program, their return to habitat numbers have increased from 286 in 2018 to 702 in 2019, which is an increase of 145%. Mary runs the program and has a few volunteers that help with TNR in her community. Her animal service officers, as well as herself, spread the word through outreach, and she would love to reach a larger audience to give specific details on the success of a smaller program in the South. Mary, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Hi, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I'm so excited to find out more about all the things that you have going on in Tennessee and the program that you're working with and everything. But first, tell me, how did you become passionate about cats? So I got my undergraduate from Maryville College, which is also in Tennessee. And then I got my master's from the University of Tennessee of Chattanooga. And there is where I did a thesis on at McKamey Animal Center, actually, which is it was on the socialization and problem solving in domestic cats. So I got to actually hang out at McKamey for about six to eight months doing different research tasks while I was there. And so that's where I really loved being in that environment. And so once I was finished with school, I started volunteering a little bit just in the summer and then I applied to start working there. And so at first I was just in the admissions department. And then after a couple months, the word got spread about the community cat program. So I applied to be the coordinator and I got that position. Wow. So you sped right up the corporate ladder there in animal welfare. Right. Yes. (laughs) It was really great. There really aren't that many organizations that have a community cat coordinator. Is this a brand new position or is this a position that they've had for several years? It's a brand new. So when we got that grant in October 2018, we had someone who was asking for the grant and then they weren't able to run it. And so they asked with our executive director if they could to run the program. So the grant funded my position for the first year. And then whenever we got that grant, it was already approved into our budget so that I would be able to stay on past the fiscal year of 2019 so that we can continue the program and continue help in Lakeside and Red Bank specifically. So that's great that you got this grant to start the program. Can you tell me a little bit about McKamey Animal Center? I mean, how big of an organization is it? How many animals are adopted out? What are the programs there? We actually have quite a lot of programs. We started in 2008. And so that is when the Chattanooga City decided to give us the grant or the funding so that they control the animal control in our area. So Chattanooga Red Bank and Lakeside is where we do animal control tasks in our city. And then we also get public funding from our community so that we can run the adoptions and foster programs and behavioral assessments, everything else that goes on that's not animal control. But specifically right now, we just decided to stop testing for FIV and FELV for cats just to help increase our save rate even more. We have a barn cat program. So for cats that aren't quite as socialized, we can adopt them out as indoor outdoor cats and they live outside in a barn that we have. We have our own feral cat colony and that's pretty much reserved for cats who I catch or one of the officers catch that does not have a safe place to return to. We keep them with us until they get used to being fed by us and they can stay on our property. We have a large property of wood so they can also stay there and we feed them every day. There's quite a lot. We rent out traps and deterrence through my program. We have a kitten nursery that our feline staff manage, which is really great. It always helps in kitten season. We have a specific place that they can go and get nurtured every day so that they can have the best chance of survival in our shelter. We have a low-cost vaccine clinic every single Wednesday. So people in our communities who can't afford to go to the vets to get their regular shots, they can come to us and get the basic needs for their animals so that they're up to date with our city ordinances and they can just keep their animals healthy and happy. 
For other low cost options, we have a food bank program where people who are on government assistance can come in and get food from us every couple of months to help feed their animals as well. We have a lot of things going on that we try our best to help with the low income people in our area so that they have as many options as possible to be great pet owners. Wow, it does sound like you have quite a lot going on there in just 12 years. It's an amazing feat of all those different programs that you've created to help with the cat population in your community. How have things changed since 2008? Can you share a little bit about at least what you have seen changing over the last 10 years? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been there since about July of 2018. And so just since I've been there, the kitten nursery is something that's new. So that was started maybe a year ago, last kitten season. They decided they needed a specific place for those kittens to be since we were getting so many. And since it was also kind of hand in hand with my community cat program, they wanted to do everything they possibly could to help with that situation. So that even if we couldn't get to the moms and dads and times outside in the field, we at least have a safe place for the moms to nurse the babies. And then for babies without their mothers, we have a safe place for them to get bottle fed by our staff and then find foster homes for them as quickly as possible so that they can go out and once they weigh enough, then they can go to our adoption floor. Our animal control officers, they have started expanding even more what they're able to do We took on a couple of new contracts. At first, we were just Chattanooga City, and recently we expanded to Lakeside and Red Bank. So we have even a larger area to cover to provide all of those needs. So we've just continually expanded so that we can help more and more people. So you mentioned the animal control officers. What's the relationship like? Are there specific tasks that you can do as a community cat coordinator? You sound like you're out there doing a lot of trapping. You're out in the community often. And then there's obviously there's the animal service officers. What specifically do they do and you do or do you both do some of the same things? Typically, when our program started in the past, they would do all of the TNR. They just wouldn't be able to do it as often. So I take over all of the TNR in our areas, the trap neuter return. And basically the only time our officers interact with cats is if there's a stray contained cat that someone has that we know isn't going to get away. If they have it in a carrier or in a certain room in their house, they will go and pick up cats that are contained as well as they will try and get injured or sick cats. And so that's the time when they will set traps for cats is if just if they're injured or sick. And basically besides that, I trap and neuter all of the other cats that we get calls about in our facility. So they're a really great partner. They let me know when specific houses they're at in our communities. They notice a lot of cats in the area. They can let me know what the address is, what the caregiver's name is, or the person who lived there. And then about how many cats as well. And then they give that information to me so that I can help those people. That's very interesting. So if your position happened to go away, those animal service officers would have to pick up the slack and start doing the trapping again. Or, you know, I just want to think about sustainability for trap new to return in Chattanooga. Is that a question in your mind at all? Yeah, absolutely. With anything, since my position is not funded through our animal control contract with the government. So for any reason that my program went away, that responsibility would have to go back to the officers because we would never want the trap neuter return services to go away. So they would definitely give that back to the officers for them to continue. And they might even try and fund it through a just a volunteer position because there are passionate people in our area who would probably be willing. So probably a balance of the animal control officers starting it again and finding volunteers who are able to do it for us. So we were talking a little bit before we hit the record button about the fact that you have a really strong relationship with the animal control. And and we've been talking about it a little bit here. But, you know, what makes it extra special? Is it just that there's mutual respect? You know, sometimes we do have conversations where people look at the animal control officers in a very negative light. And it sounds like you have a very positive relationship. Do the other folks in your organization interact with animal services? Or is this just a personal relationship that you have with the ACOs? I would say it's definitely a mixture of personal relationship. We have a lot of 
support from our upper management, our executive director, as well as our director of animal services. They really love that my position was created so that I can handle everything related to community cats in our area. So they jump at the opportunity to help me in any way that they can. We often meet and talk about the progress of each of our departments and how we're benefiting the other one. So I think it's just really important to keep that communication open so that they know how successful it is and how we're going to eventually have fewer and fewer kittens coming in, which will help the burden on the animal control officers as well. So I think as long as that communication is kept open and the successes are shared with each other, then that's how we were able to get such a good relationship. And I think if other people are able to do that as well, then it will continue getting better and better. So it's June. We just had our online kitten conference this past weekend. So we talked about all things kitten. You are either in the middle of or heading into kitten season and fostering. You know, share a little bit. What are your thoughts always going into kitten season? And maybe in Tennessee, it's not that big of a jump. Certainly in New England, we definitely have a kitten season. Yes, we definitely have a kitten season here as well. For the past couple of years, I've pulled data. There's basically always a big spike in late March and early April, and then it just continues going up until about August. Then it'll very slowly, our straight intake will start going down on kittens. But for the most part, What we really try and do, we intake them. Our foster coordinator works as quickly as possible to get those kittens into a foster home with or without the mom. Obviously, we prefer if the mom is brought in, but occasionally that just doesn't happen. So we get those kittens out as quickly as possible so that they can have a good home in foster care. And so that way they have a better chance of surviving. What are your greatest challenges in your position at McKamey Animal Center? I think one of our biggest challenges is just getting people to support the program. We have a couple of people in the community who are really fighting for us to get the word out and get more and more people on board. But as with any animal control in the past, there hasn't been that much support for TNR. So people are often weary when they see me and see me setting traps and talking with me because they're afraid the caregivers in our community that we're not going to return the cats. So it's my job to try and spread the word and say, no, that we absolutely bring them back. We have a very small percentage of cats who aren't healthy enough to be returned. So I just really explain to them the benefits of why we're trapping, how they recover after they've been fixed, and about how they're going to start behaving differently, hopefully. Oftentimes, you know, there's people who say that their behaviors start improving drastically after they're fixed. So it's just really explaining all the positive outcomes of the spay and neuter of feral and community cats so that people understand and start to trust us more and more so that they can tell us that they're feeding, tell us where they're feeding and how many there are so that they know we'll bring them back and those cats will live a longer and healthier life. So in most cases, people are worried about the cats not coming back? I wouldn't say in most cases, but in the year that I've been doing this, people do often stop me and are just wanting to make sure because they've heard things because we do a lot of outreach. So they hear that they come back, but they would just want that verbal confirmation, just being double ensured that they are going to come back because these caregivers, it's such an act of passion what they're doing. So they're just rightfully worried of animal control just from in the past that it hasn't always been the case. So we just have to make sure that they understand what McKamey is about and how we're there to help them. So in addition to our online kitten conference, we also do a webinar series with neighborhood cats on various different community cat issues. And we did a webinar on trappers tips and tricks in March. And then we're going to have a drop trap webinar later in June. And folks can find out about that at communitycatspodcast.com. So as a trapper, obviously, you are a very successful trapper. If you're trapping hundreds and hundreds of cats, what are your favorite tools of the trade? And would you share any trappers tips and tricks? Absolutely. Especially right now in kitten season, we all often get calls about people finding kittens in a bush or something near their house or somewhere. So if we can get out quick enough, And my favorite thing is just to use those kittens as bait for the moms. So if I can get there and wait for the mom to leave that litter and I will safely get them in a carrier. And then what I like to do is set a trap up right next to that carrier of the kittens and use them as the bait. Because once those kittens start meowing and start begging for their mom, the mom will almost always go in that trap so that we can get all of them together instead of having 
just the kittens brought in, which of course puts a burden on all of our foster care people as well. So that's my personal favorite. Just being able to use the kittens as bait is always very satisfying. And it's always just an adventure of seeing if it's going to work. But besides using kittens, my biggest thing is just, of course, what everyone says is really, really smelly food. The smellier, the better. Tuna, really stinky cat foods. And then all of the support from the caregivers is essential. So I typically call the caregivers a day or two before I'm going to come out and ask them to not feed so that they are not hungry or that they are hungry so that we can have a better chance of catching them. As we emerge from the global pandemic of COVID, fostering is emerging as the new normal in the animal welfare industry. But shelter management software doesn't provide the tools or the workflows for communicating with fosters at scale. So many organizations struggle to maintain hundreds of animals in foster homes. If only there was a system that was custom built specifically to solve this problem. Introducing Foster Space, powered by our friends at Dubert. Foster Space was custom built to allow you to manage hundreds of foster relationships and to communicate with them via text, email, and even Facebook Messenger. Your fosters have a portal where they can upload videos and photos and updates on their animals. And organizations can schedule fosters for meet and greets, adoption days, or anything else they need. There's so much more to check out. Sign up for free at www.dubert.com and go to the Foster Space tab to get started. Are you one of the selfless members of our society that spends time rescuing and bettering the lives of cats in your community? If so, wouldn't it make sense to do the most you can with the space you have? CDE Animal Cages is a family-owned and operated business that has been handcrafting the highest quality small animal cages for over 30 years with the goal of connecting shelters and rescuers with comfort and security for the health of the animals they work with and ease of use for the humans that take care of them. Open air enclosures with various solid options and portalized options have proved not only to reduce euthanasia rates, but make for more adoptions and healthier and happier animals. Our high quality materials are designed to last for decades, ensuring that you only shop for cages once, leaving more time to spend with the cats in your life. Get started today by logging on to cdecages.com to design your perfect setup. Invest in the future of your cats with CDE Animal Cages. Do you use a drop trap? Oh, that is one thing that's on our list to buy. We actually do not have a drop trap right now. One of our volunteers has one. So when she goes out and traps, she does use it and has a great success with it. So that is on our purchase list. (laughs) I think you'll have a fun time with that one. Yeah, I've heard great things. Over the years, what are the, with the cat numbers like? Is the shelter seeing fewer cats and kittens with the various programs that you've had going on there? So part of my position, whenever I go out and I see and find kittens that don't have a mom, I will end up bringing them to the shelter. So our intake numbers for 2019 actually went up a little bit with the start of our program because I was bringing in so many kittens during kitten season. But what has happened on the flip side is that since we're able to spay and neuter and return so many as well, it's kind of counteracting each other to where our euthanasia rate has decreased a significant amount because we have a lot more time and resources to put into the cats that are staying in our facility. So it's kind of a counteraction of, yes, the intake is going up, but we also are giving so many um, new resources to the animals that we have and sending so many back out to where they're being fed and watered that it's kind of bouncing out and creating a lovely decrease in euthanasia. So what is your save rate? As of right now, for cats of 2019, it was 90%. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, we've worked very hard. Our foster and feline departments have been doing amazing work, working with my program and working with Saving the Kittens, that it's gone up 12% in a year. So in 2018, our save rate was about 78. In 2019, it was 90. That's great. So I want to go back a little bit with the conversation around the kittens and the mom cats. Do you have a certain determination as to when you leave mom and kittens out there versus when you trap them and bring them in? Do you wait until the kittens are five or six weeks old, you know, a little bit just in case you you don't get the mom? And also if mom is feral, sometimes mom and kittens don't get along so well in a confined environment. Do you have any advice for folks as to, you know, what you should do 
if you find a litter of kittens rather than just like immediately go in there and start like sticking your hands in the litter of kittens? So when people call in to me and ask either myself or our admissions department what to do with a group of small kittens that they find, we typically ask them just to wait and leave them where they are for at least a couple hours. I prefer for them to wait four or five hours. If the mom still isn't there after that amount of time, then if they're uncomfortable with leaving them, they can bring them to us. But we do just try and explain to them as much as possible that the most important thing is for them to stay with their mom. So if that's an option, that's the preference. Even if we know that they're going to be unneutered outside, it's the better option for survival for them to stay with their mom for at least a couple weeks longer so that they have a better chance of survival. But a lot of times since we are open intake, people either don't call us first or just aren't comfortable with waiting that long. So when they do bring them in and they're that small and they need immediate caring and feeding, then that's just when our foster coordinator, she has a team of really dedicated foster parents who will come same day and pick them up and immediately start giving them the attention that they need. And on the other side, do you have an age range for kittens that you decide to return or is that done on a case by case basis? Technically, we try and wait until they're at least three months old if we send them back out if they're feral. There have been occasions where they've just been so feral and we don't have a foster parent who's willing to socialize them. So in those situations, if we only return them if we know for a fact that they have a caregiver. So I have a couple of different locations in our area that have really large colonies. And if we happen to catch a really, maybe like a 10 week old or maybe 12 week old kitten, that's just very, very feisty. Then we will go ahead and contact that caregiver and make sure that they are okay with the cat coming back. Just because we oftentimes don't have the resources to completely socialize them in time to where they're going to be adopted quickly. So it's just that they have a better chance of a healthier life just living outside. So it just really comes down to if we have a good caregiver who knows about the situation and is willing to look out for that kitten. Mary, if folks are interested in finding out more about your program and your organization, how would they do that? So we have our website. It's www.mckamieanimalcenter.org. And if you specifically want to learn about community cats, you can go to the services tab and then community cats is right there. And that's where you can read all about our program and all of the services that we offer. And if you just want to go to our website, you can see what everything McKamey does with dogs, cats, exotic animals, everything of the like. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I just want to make sure the message gets out there. If you are in a community that does not have either low cost spay neuter options or an animal shelter that doesn't have those resources, just to reach out as best you can, see what you are able to do in your community and reach out to rescue groups, anyone in the area so that we can help in this overpopulation and homelessness of cats and kittens in our area. Mary, I want to thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show. That was the perfect way to end the show. And I hope in the future we'll have you on. We'll update the numbers in a year's time or so. So thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for folks listening today, I'd like to really reach out and ask you to consider sharing the show. It's great to hear these success stories from organizations down in the South that are really making a difference, changing the lives for cats in their area and really do an incredible job. So please share this success story with others to help encourage others to do the same. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to a Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 